Are you ready for the word? Yes. <clears throat> Turn to Matthew chapter 12. If you haven't yet gone to creationstandard.com to register or to offer support to Josh, please make sure you do that. And at that time, Yeshua went on the Sabbath day through the corn, which is wheat. And his disciples were hungry and began to pluck the ears of corn and to eat. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, Behold, your disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. Where does Torah forbid them from doing that? Doesn't. So what do they mean when they say it's not lawful? Their oral law or oral traditions is what they meant. But he said unto them, we have what they said to him. Now we're going to see what he said unto them. <clears throat> have you not read what David did when he was hungry and they that were with him, how he entered into the house of the mighty one and did eat the showbread which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them which were with him, but only for the priests. Or have you not read in the law how that on the Sabbath days, the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? In other words, labor is prohibited on the Sabbath day. But these priests... They don't come in in their Armani suits, sit in a green room, eat hors d'oeuvres, and uh, wait to go out and teach a little lesson and then get a big honorarium given to them. These guys work, and they work hard. The difference is they're not doing servile labor, and we could do, and will one day, do a, a, a message on what the difference between what they're doing and servile labor. <clears throat> but I say unto you, verse 6, and that in this place is one greater than the temple. So here's my summary of what Yeshua said unto them. And that is, your Sabbath doctrine that you have created is contradicted by Scripture. Can't be supported by Scripture. Or we could say it this way, Scripture contradicts the doctrine that you're holding to. <clears throat> Verse 7. But if you had known what this means, I'll have mercy and not sacrifice you would not have condemned the guiltless. <clears throat> let me summarize. We could spend an entire session on that verse, but let me summarize it by saying this, saying it this way. Yeshua said to them, you want to do that which shows how strict you are, how dedicated and how committed you are. But Yahweh wanted simple obedience from you, not great sacrifices. That's what he wanted. Simple obedience. The word uh, mercy there, you go back and look that up in, in Hosea chapter 6, verse 6, which is what he's quoting. It, it means to nod, to, to bow the neck, to bow the neck. It, it's an act of kindness to a superior. And what Yahweh wants us to do is when he tells us to do something, is us just say, yes, sir. Okay? <clears throat> now, verse 8. Several years ago, uh, Brian was working at West Wind. They did something on helicopters, Army helicopters. And he invited me to an event they were having and introduced me to a man who was active duty Army. I forget his rank, but he was active duty Army. And this man let me fly a Chinook in a simulator. <clears throat> they had this huge simulator. He invited me in, set me in, showed me the controls, and we flew that Chinook. And the, the awesome thing about this very expensive simulator is when you got in it, went to fill in the controls, they had the screen in front of you, you felt like you were flying. Uh, you didn't feel like you were in a toy. He said, where do you want to fly today? I said, I don't know. He said, let's go to San Diego. He punched it in, and it was just like you were flying a helicopter over and around San Diego. And he said they use it to, for recognizance to prepare their soldiers for missions they will fly. That, that they take photographs of where they're going, of all the terrain, and they plug it into that thing so that their soldiers 
when they go out on the mission, they're not surprised by anything. They're completely informed because of this simulator. And uh, I was bragging and complimenting him on the awesomeness of this piece of equipment, to which he responded to me, Mr. Martin, in the U.S. Army, we believe it is entirely logical to kill a mosquito with a sledgehammer. I loved that. Well, in Matthew 12, the Pharisees came flying out of their stagnant pond, buzzing around Yeshua and his disciples with their nonsense. Well, here comes the sledgehammer. Yeshua said, for the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. In other words, he gave them a couple of illustrations to show them how wrong they were. But, but then he said to them, Here, here's the main point I need to make to you. You're not the boss on this job. You don't get to make up rules for the Sabbath. You don't get to determine what can and can't be done on the Sabbath. You don't get to establish your own kind of Sabbath. I get to do that. My father set it up. Now I'm in charge, not you. I love that. The word Lord there is curios, and it means supreme in authority, the master, the controller. So he said the Son of Man has uh, supreme authority over the Sabbath day. <clears throat> well, the Lunar Sabbatarians have confronted the disciples of Yeshua and have told us that our Saturday is not the true Sabbath and that, that what we're doing is not lawful. They have a stricter, more enlightened, more difficult way to keep the Sabbath, they claim. However, I've listened to and I've examined all of their arguments for a lunar Sabbath, and I've examined all of their arguments against the seven-day perpetual cycle observance of the Sabbath, and I say this, their doctrines cannot be supported by Scripture. Scriptures contradict the doctrines they hold to. Their desire to do the difficult has led them astray from simple obedience. Yahweh desires mercy and not sacrifice. And I say Yeshua has supreme authority over the Sabbath. He's the one that makes the rules, and he has not authorized a lunar Sabbath. There were 11 reasons that we've been going over that they say they reject the seventh day. And, and we have looked at all of them except for two, which is number nine and number 11. And we're going to cover uh, those today. But, <laughs> however, before I move on to number nine and number 11, um, I need to make sure I, I am clear on some things I stated about their fourth reason, which was in, in their fourth reason for rejecting the lunar Sabbath, they said that you and I depend too greatly upon the Gregorian calendar, and the Gregorian calendar is pagan, and um, <clears throat> that calendar uses the word Saturday for the seventh day, and Saturn is a pagan god. But anyway, their point is we depend too greatly upon the Gregorian calendar, and Last week, I focused a great deal on how that that calendar is not so much pagan as it is civilian and utilitarian. It, it helps us function in the world. But before we move on from that subject, <clears throat> I need to make sure I properly, properly clarify their objection when it comes to the calendar. And that is this. They say that we use the lights of heaven to mark the other seven Moedim. The 14th day of the first month, the 15th day of the first month, the first day of the seventh month, we use the moon to mark all the other Moedim. They say when it comes to the Sabbath day that we go to the Gregorian calendar and let a uh, pagan calendar tell us when the Sabbath is. But that they, they don't do that. They stay with the Bible. They stay with the moon. They use Yahweh's calendar to determine when the Sabbath is. Well, <clears throat> that's not true. That's falsehood. And, and let me give you two reasons that, that what they're saying there is false. Number one, 
They cannot use the moon to determine when the Sabbath is. They cannot. That's a ludicrous claim that has no scriptural support. Be patient with me here because we've got to make sure we drive these points home. Uh, remember Exodus chapter 20. Here, here's what it says. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. That's a simple command, isn't it? Okay, now what we need to do, he told us to remember it to keep it holy. Now we need to know when it is. So he's going to tell us. Six days shall you labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of Yahweh your Elohim. There it is, simple as it can be. Six days you shall work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath. The seventh day is the Sabbath. And what is, what is the reference points by which we understand these terms that he uses there? Six days you'll labor, seventh day you'll rest because it's the Sabbath of Yahweh, your Elohim. What's the reference point? Creation. creation week. You can't get away from it. It's the creation week. All right. <clears throat> so why do I labor for six days and rest on the seventh? Because verse 11 for in six days, Yahweh made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. For in six days, he created everything and rested on the seventh day. Wherefore, Yahweh blessed the Sabbath day, the seventh day, and hallowed it. So, so it's clear there, it is undeniable that there is, was, a seven-day cycle set in place in Genesis 1 and 2. And that our instructions concerning the Sabbath are eternally linked to the creation week. In six days he made it, he rested the Sabbath, he blessed the Sabbath day. The lunar Sabbatarian doctrines claim that they use Yahweh's calendar to establish all of Yahweh's Moedim, including the Sabbath, is said to make it seem that they're being true to Yahweh. That they have not forsaken his ways, but you and I have forsaken his ways, and we've turned to Pope Gregory to tell us when the Sabbath is. But again, that's a ludicrous claim. The claim sounds holy until you examine it and see that it blatantly contradicts what is written. There is no biblical calendar instruction to use the moon to establish the Sabbath. So <clears throat> that claim is, is blatantly false. Number two, the second reason that, that their claim that they follow Yahweh's calendar and we follow Pope Gregory is, is false, is this, we do not. I hope you understand this. We don't follow Pope Gregory or his calendar to establish our Sabbath. Right. <clears throat> the Gregorian calendar did not establish a seven-day perpetual cycle. Pope Gregory didn't say, i tell you what we ought to do. We ought to make a seven-day week. It's not what he did. Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 established the seven-day cycle and set it in, play, in place. You want to talk about Yahweh's calendar, you have to start there. You, you can't wait until you get to Psalm 104 and establish Yahweh's calendar. You can't wait until you get Leviticus 23 and establish Yahweh's calendar. Yahweh established his calendar in Genesis 1, and, it, and the evening and the morning were the first day. The evening and the morning were the second day. He established that seven-day cycle. He set the seven-day cycle in place, and he marked the seventh day as the Sabbath. Pope Gregory did not set the seven-day cycle in place, but it cannot be denied that the Gregorian calendar acknowledged that there was a seven-day cycle. I don't care what they call it. I don't care what they call the seventh day. Well, I do. Nothing I can do about what they call the seventh day. I call it the Sabbath. The fact remains that the Gregorian calendar acknowledges that there are seven days in the cycle. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. We say first day, second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day, seventh day, right? Well, where in the world did Pope Gregory get that idea? Genesis 1 and 2. And the Gregorian calendar may have put 28 days in one month and 29 in it sometimes and may have had 30 days in some months and 31 days in others. <clears throat> but 
the Gregorian calendar did not alter the seven-day cycle that Yahweh set in place. It left that cycle alone. So let us reason together. It's true the Gregorian calendar calls our seventh day Saturday, and that's regrettable, but you and I know it's the seventh day. Try as they might, <clears throat> and boy have they, with all of their might, but try as they might, no one has ever been able to prove that the perpetual cycle set in place in Genesis 1 and 2 has ever been altered. Ever. And they would love to prove it has. But there's no proof <clears throat> that seven-day cycle has stayed in effect. We're not forsaking Yahweh's biblical calendar when we keep the seventh day, and we're not turning to Pope Gregory for instruction. Pope Gregory is just acknowledging that the seventh day that we call the Sabbath, he calls it Saturday. That's all it is. All right, <clears throat> with that done, let's move on to reason number nine. They give for rejecting the seventh day as holy. They say to keep a seven-day continuous unbroken cycle, Sabbath is, is to take away from Torah which is forbidden. Taking away from Torah is forbidden in Deuteronomy 12, 32. I think in the handout I gave y'all is a typo. I put 12, 31. Didn't catch that till this morning. <clears throat> but it's actually Deuteronomy 12, 32. What things soever I command you, observe to do it. You shall not add thereto nor diminish from it. So they're saying we are diminishing from it taking away from Torah. Deuteronomy 4.2 says the same thing, pretty much. You shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall you diminish aught from it, that you may keep the commandments of Yahweh your Elohim, which I command you. Notice, what it's, notice how 4.2 words it. <clears throat> you shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall you diminish aught from it, that you may keep the commandments. If you add to it, it's going to prevent you from keeping the commandments. You're, you're going to distort it. If you take away, it certainly is going to keep you from uh, keeping them, right? But don't add to or diminish aught from it that you may keep the commandments. <clears throat> what are the lunar Sabbatarians accusing you and I of diminishing? What are they accusing you and I of taking out and not paying attention to? Got any idea? We've been studying it. Do I need to go back to February and let's go through this whole thing again for another <laughs> 10 weeks? Everybody said, no. <clears throat> any idea? The moon? In what way? Every one of them, every time when they say we're diminishing, taking something out and, and refusing to allow it to be there, that's the one that they're talking about. Psalm 104, 19. He appointed the moon for seasons. The sun knows it's going down. He appointed the moon for seasons. He appointed the moon for seasons. So that's what they tell us. And because we won't acknowledge that the moon is for seasons, we're taking from the word. We're diminishing from the word. <clears throat> the word seasons there is moedim, right? And so they say the word moedim refers to the feast of Yahweh, and the moon's been appointed for the feast, and Leviticus 23 says the Sabbath is a moedim, therefore the moon is appointed to regulate the Sabbath. And if we don't acknowledge that, we are taking away from the word which Deuteronomy 12 and Deuteronomy 4 <clears throat> prohibits us from doing. Well, is it true that we're diminishing things from Torah when we refuse Psalm 104? We're not diminishing or emitting scripture at all. We are rightly dividing the word of truth when it comes to both Leviticus 23 and Psalm 104. Leviticus 23 is clear. Let's look at it again. That's where we have to start because Leviticus 23 is clear. 
They say you can't separate out the Sabbath and treat it different, but yet Leviticus 23 does separate it out and treat it different. Leviticus 23 tells you exactly when every Moedim will be. And it does that for the Sabbath in verse 3. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest, the holy convocation. You shall do no work therein. It is the Sabbath of Yahweh in all your dwellings. When does the Sabbath take place? Clearly stated, on the seventh day. A reference to Exodus 20, a reference to Genesis 2. So, when we go to Psalm 104.19, in our study, Yahweh showed us something very important. In all the years that we have been celebrating the feast, we never saw it. It came by revelation knowledge from Yahweh himself. He revealed something to us about Psalm 104, 19 that we didn't know. Do you remember what it was? Good thing we're revealing. Does the word Moedim mean the feast of Yahweh? No. Does it mean the appointed times of Yahweh? No. Does it mean appointments? Yes. Set times? Yes. yes, but it doesn't mean the set times of Yahweh. And we had illustrations of this. He set a set time for a plague in Egypt. A moed. He set a moed for when Sarah would give birth. Right? Uh, he set a set time for a moed for when Daniel's visions would come to pass. He set a moed, uh, a moed for when Habakkuk's visions would come to pass. Moed does not mean the appointed feast of Yahweh or the appointed times of Yahweh. Moed means set times and appointed times. The only way we can know whether it is referring to a feast day or something else is by context. Is there anything in all of Psalm 104 that hints at the feast of Yahweh? You're hesitant. In Psalm 104, there's nothing about the feast days of Yahweh. Nothing. So the context tells you that that word moed in Psalm 104 is not about Yahweh's feast. The moon has been appointed for set times, but it has nothing to do with the feast of Yahweh. So what we do, we're refusing to allow the lunar Sabbath doctrine to add that verse to Leviticus 23. We're refusing to allow them to insert it in Leviticus 23 because it doesn't fit. You can't take the definition of Leviticus 23, transfer it to Psalm 104, and then bring Psalm 104 back to Leviticus 23 and make it say something it didn't say originally. Right? They want to force it into Leviticus 23. We will not allow it. So they start crying out, you're taken away from Torah. No, no. What we're doing is what Deuteronomy 5.1 tells us to do. Deuteronomy 5.1 says concerning Torah, you shall learn it, keep it, do it. So we learn it, then what's the next responsibility we have? To keep it. And do you remember what keep means? Guard it, protect it, put a hedge about it. And so we have learned it, and now we guard it and protect it and we're not going to allow them to go to Psalm 104, twist the meaning of a word and bring it back and insert it in Torah and make Torah say something that it never said. We're not diminishing from the word. We're doing what Deuteronomy 5 told us to do. We're protecting Torah. Hallelujah. The perversion of Psalm 104, 19 is essential to their false claims. Without it, their doctrine crumbles to the floor. Therefore, it's no wonder they spend so much effort and energy trying to force us to accept it, to say something that it doesn't say. <clears throat> Examine it. Read it. Go back home tonight or today and read Psalm 104, all of it. There's no part of Psalm 104 that has anything to do with the appointed times of Yahweh as feast days. And, and therefore, the moon has absolutely nothing to do with the Sabbath. They hyper-focus 
on this pack, passage refuse to see what is plainly there to see. Listen to me now. Because they hyper-focus on this passage, they're unable to see what can clearly be seen, and that is, Moedim does not mean the Feast of Yahweh, and the context of Psalm 104 has nothing to do with the Feast. They can't see those two things because they hyper-focused on the word Moedim. Now, I'm going to show you a video. And I want you, it's going to tell you what to do, but I want you to notice the people in the white. Pay attention only to them. And I want you to see if you can count how many times those in white pass the basketball. <laughs> the instructor was brilliant. He had us hyper-focused on the white shirt. A gorilla walked out in front of us and did a dance and we never saw it. <laughs> Yeshua would call this a parable. They want us to hyper-focus on Psalm 104, 19. Yahweh appointed the moon for the Moedim. Yahweh appointed the moon for the Moedim. Look right here. He appointed the moon for the Moedim. Yahweh appointed the moon for the Moedim. Hey, whoa, look right here. Psalm 104, 19. He appointed the moon for the Moedim. And if they can get you hyper-focused on that, you'll not see the plain language of Genesis 2. You will not see the plain language of Exodus 20. You will not see the plain language of Deuteronomy 5. You will not see the plain language of Deuteronomy, or excuse me, of Leviticus 23. That you won't see that every one of those contradict the doctrine they're building from Psalm 104, 19, because you're hyper-focused on Yahweh appointed the moon for the Moedim. Let's examine that claim just a little further. The Torah command is, do not add to or take away. Let's go over the list of things that it's evident they add. They add a new moon day to Genesis 1. It's not there. They add instruction that makes the moon determine the start of a week when it's nowhere in Torah. They add instruction that makes the Sabbath on the 8th, 15th, 22nd, and 29th when it's nowhere in Torah that that is so. And they add a non-day when the month has 30 days when that is nowhere in Torah. They say the new moon is neither a Sabbath day nor a work day. That's nowhere in Torah. They add that when the moon was created on the fourth day, it must have been created four days old. That's not in Torah. You shall not add to nor diminish all from. They're adding a lot, speculating a lot, a lot, and coming up with a lot of conjecture. Let's go over things they diminish from Torah. Torah says you shall work six days, but the seventh day is a Sabbath. Well, they have difficulty with that because they insert a new moon day in there. And they're also, every couple of months, there's a 30th day in there. Both of those things means that they have to ignore the perfect cycle of seven days. Some, day there's, some days there, or some weeks, their cycle has eight days. Sometimes their cycle has nine days. It says you'll work six days and the seventh day is a Sabbath. Sometimes they have a seventh day and an eighth day. Now do you... Uh, excuse me, an eighth day and a ninth day. Now do you see why they say that the new moon is neither a work day nor a Sabbath day? Because when you corner them and say, well, it says work six days and seventh day is a Sabbath. What do you do with the new moon? Is, is that a work day? No. Well, then it's a Sabbath day. Well, no, it's not, not a Sabbath day either. All right, so it's not a work day and not a Sabbath day. What, what, what is it? Well, it, it's a non-day. <clears throat> It's just a new moon day. It's a special day. It has its own special classification. Well, what about the 30th day? Well, we don't want to talk about that. 
They diminish from Torah. Any doctrine that has you write at most three out of four Sabbaths, at most 75% of the time, is not sound doctrine. Because if you look at their lunar Sabbath calendar, you can say, okay, on this week they worked six and had a Sabbath. Worked six and had a Sabbath and worked six and had a Sabbath. But on the first one, there were either six or there were either seven or eight days before they had a Sabbath. So they're right only seventy at the most. They're not right at all, but the, at the most, they'd only be right 75% of the time. <clears throat> That's not sound doctrine. All right. We're going to move on to reason number 11. We're moving fast. Number 11, for rejecting the seventh day is holy. They say those who keep the seventh day do so because they see the lunar Sabbath doctrine to be too difficult to do, and so they reject it on that basis. You and I reject the lunar Sabbath doctrine because we're not willing to make the sacrifices necessary to keep it. It's too hard for us. It's actually disgusting to me how many times this argument is presented. And, and here's why it's disgusting to me. Just because you're doing something more difficult doesn't make that thing right. Consider the Pharisees versus Yeshua. Who kept Torah more perfectly, they or him? He did. Who had the stricter doctrines? They or him? They did. Just because you're doing something more difficult, and theirs was difficult, doesn't make the thing you're doing right. They were always confronting Yeshua because their doctrines were stricter than his, but their strict doc doctrines actually led, led them into error, which goes back to what Deuteronomy 4 told us, that you need to make sure you don't add to or diminish from, because if you add to or diminish from, even adding to, you'll not be able to keep the commandments. Well, I'm adding this stuff to it so that it will aid me to keep the commandments. Deuteronomy 4 says it'll keep you from keeping the commandments. By the Pharisees' strict doctrines, they would have never plucked grain on the Sabbath to eat. But in Matthew 12, Yeshua's disciples did. And their accusation in Matthew 12 against Yeshua is this. Your disciples don't walk as we walk because our walk is too difficult for them. We live with a greater dedication to the law and we how we are more enlightened we we are more committed to keeping torah but the truth is the strictness they had created themselves for themselves was causing them to break torah we read matthew 12 and yeshua told them three things your sabbath doctrine contradicts scripture he used uh, David as an example. He used priestly, priestly duties in the temple as an example. He told them, your Sabbath doctrine is a violation of the principle laid out in Hosea 6, 6, which states that Yahweh desires mercy and not sacrifice. And I've already explained to you what mercy is. And the third thing he said to them, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. He is the supreme authority over the Sabbath. He's the one that makes the rules, not them. These same three principles laid out in Matthew 12 will safeguard us against the lunar Sabbath doctrine. Their doctrines contradict Scripture. They need to embrace simple obedience instead of looking for some great sacrificial feat to do for Yahweh. And they need to understand that they cannot make the rule for when the Sabbath is. Yahweh did that. Not Yesh and, not and now... Yeshua has supreme authority over the Sabbath. And if he wanted it changed from the seventh day to the 8th, 15th, 22nd, 29th, he would have done it. He fixed a lot of stuff, corrected a lot of stuff while he was here. He never corrected when the seventh day was. 
Uncontrolled zeal and undisciplined curiosity will lead people astray. Back in February, I began the examination of the Lunar Sabbath doctrine as a teaching. I'd been looking at it for well over a year. Uh, the very first message Yahweh had me deliver was out of the epistle of James. I went back and looked at it uh, last night. Just pulled it up and looked at it. The title of that message was, You Cannot Argue Yahweh in Submission. And the subtitle was, Uncontrolled Zeal and Undisciplined Curiosity. That's Gary Player, in case you didn't know. Um, very great golfer back in the 60s, <clears throat> maybe early 70s. Again, I, I saw that many, many weeks ago and thought, saw it as a parable from which you and I could learn. Um, there are multitudes who were serving Yahweh amazingly. They were doing good. They came out of observing pagan holidays. They came out of Sunday worship. They came out of believing that the law had passed away and the law was bondage. They came out of, of doctrines that taught them that they didn't have to keep the law. And they came into Torah and they were doing good. They were learning it, keeping it, and doing it. But they kept looking for coaches who would make it more and more difficult so that they could continue to prove their devotion to Yahweh. It felt good to turn their back on, on lies. Felt good to do that. And to finally learn how to obey Yahweh, that felt good to them. Felt, feels good to all of us. Feels good. And, and so they walk in that for a while, but, but they want that good feeling again. And so they keep turning to people who will tell them something more difficult to do so they can prove that they're a champion for Yahweh. They did run well. They were doing good. But, but their desire to do something more caused them to go astray. Uncontrolled zeal and undisciplined curiosity, which brings us to James 3. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. If you have true wisdom, it doesn't lead to arrogance. It doesn't lead to a prideful declaration. Hey, look at me. I'm serving Yahweh with greater sacrifice than you are. I'm doing the more difficult thing. You're not willing to do the difficult thing. It leads to a good life evidenced by good works, meekness, and humility. Um, but if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. That word translated bitter means sharp or piercing. The word translated uh, envying is the Greek word zealous, zealous zeal. If you have sharp, piercing zeal, so listen to the instruction. James didn't say, man, if you have sharp, piercing zeal, hallelujah, welcome to the assembly. He said, glory not. Do not be proud of having that characteristic or that attribute in your life. Because it's a very dangerous attribute to have. The word translated strife, it's not a good translation. Let me say it this way, when, when you and I hear the word strife in our minds, we think it refers to somebody that yeah, yeah. Is. It's always like, likes to get in the middle of stuff and just yeah, 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 and stir up arguments and stuff. But, but the actual definition of the word strife here means to be intrigued. And to be intrigued means to be curious of something that is strange or new, always curious for something strange or new. So listen to the true meaning of verse 14, the true message of verse 14. James said, if you have in your heart uncontrollable zeal and undisciplined curiosity, 
You should not glory. Those are not traits to be proud of. Those are not traits to, be bra to brag about. And, and then he says, do not lie against the truth. Uncontrollable zeal and undisciplined curiosity leads people to more lies than it does to truth. They will result in a person going so far in their pursuits that they begin to lie against truth. They trust their own hearts and their own zeal more than they trust what's written. I'm not attacking anybody. I'm not attacking. I, I, I'm not going after anyone at all. I'm simply confronting this doctrine. <clears throat> the lunar Sabbath doctrine is causing people to utter falsehoods against the truth. The Sabbath is a sign between Yahweh and His people set in place by Yahweh Himself. Yahweh Himself wrote it with His finger into a tablet of stone. Uncontrolled zeal and undisciplined curiosity is leading people to misinterpret Psalm 104.19 and to create a doctrine that opposes the very foundational doctrine of the Sabbath. Their zeal to do the difficult thing for Yahweh is causing them. They don't mean to. Their zeal is sincere, is for Yahweh. But their zeal to do the difficult thing for Yahweh is causing them to lie against truth. It's causing them to try to destroy the seventh day Sabbath. <clears throat> James said this wisdom descends not from above, but it's earthly, it's sensual, and it's devilish. What wisdom is he talking about? The wisdom that thinks that uncontrollable zeal and undisciplined curiosity are good traits. For where envy and strife is, there's confusion in every evil work. When I began this study, I prayed and asked Yahweh for weeks for the wisdom I would need to do a series of teachings as we tested the Lunar Sabbath Doctrine. And I told you back in February that when I prayed, this is the verse. Verse 16 is the verse that kept, kept rising up in my spirit. <clears throat> and uh, I kept pushing it aside because I felt like it had nothing to do with what I was praying for him about or praying to him about. I need help teaching on the Lunar Sabbath Doctrine. This is the verse he kept bringing me to. Now several weeks into this series, series I realize that that verse has everything to do with what we've been doing for the last few months. Where envying and strife is, there is every evil, evil work. This verse is key, so listen carefully to it again. Where, where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. The word translated envying there is the same word used in verse 15. It means uncontrolled zeal. The word translated strife there is the same word used up in verse 15. And it means an undisciplined curiosity or intrigue with the strange and the new. Those are not good traits to have. <clears throat> Those traits cause people to carelessly and haphazardly follow their curiosity down every little rabbit hole and tune into every YouTube channel they can find and submit their heart and their ears to every tongue set on fire of hell that is teaching on every kind of doctrine that can be imagined. And then they wonder why they have confusion. Too many voices. There are millions of voices on the internet <clears throat> and it is inevitable that zeal and curiosity will get you into serious trouble. The warning of, of, of the scriptures that, that we need to guard our heart with all diligence was never needed more than it is in mine and your day. Guard your heart with all diligence because people's desire to serve Yahweh is greater 
it, or to serve Yahweh in greater and greater ways, if they're not careful, it can expose them to things that will lead them astray. When all they really had was the desire to learn. I want to learn all I can learn. And, and, and you come out of situations where you were lied to and you, you turn into this stuff and regrettably start believing more lies. Where there, are, where there is uncontrolled zeal and undisciplined curiosity, two things happen. Number one, there is confusion. That is instability and disorder. <clears throat> Lunar Sabbath doctrine is disorder. And there's every evil work. Phallos is the word. Foul, we would say. And, and the word translated evil there means foul things that are, are habitual or repeated. So, so let me ask you this. What is more foul than a doctrine that leads people to think that they're doing some great thing for Yahweh when in fact they're actually opposing what he said. That's foul. That's why James calls it confusion. They think they're doing some great thing for Yahweh, but instead through their zeal, they're, they're causing instability, disorder, and they're lying against the truth. We're going to close by looking at Paul, and we're going to see the uh, danger of uncontrolled zeal. He said it caused him to persecute the very assembly of Yahweh, to ravage it, destroy it, and waste it. Here's what he said in Galatians 3, 1, excuse me, Galatians 1, 13. For you have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure, I persecuted the assembly of Yahweh and wasted it and profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. He had an uncontrolled zeal. He thought he was doing some great thing for Yahweh when he persecuted Yahweh's assembly. It was Yahweh's very assembly. He thought he was serving Yahweh when he tried to waste it, destroy it, and ruin it. He thought he was doing some great thing for Yahweh when he participated in the killing of Stephen. He thought he was doing some great thing for Yahweh when he arrested men and women for the crime. He arrested them and threw them in prison for the crime of believing that Yeshua was the Messiah. He thought he was defending Yahweh when he threw them in prison, men and women. But Yahweh, through Yeshua, confronted him and turned him to the truth. That's not the last time, regrettably, that his uncontrolled zeal got him into trouble. We read in the book of Acts of another account, and I'm going to go through this quickly. Many of you know about it. But just in case you don't, I want to point it out to you. Because this is written for our, for our admonition. You start reading somewhere, I think, along Acts 16 or so. <clears throat> Paul sets his face to go to Jerusalem. Acts 17, maybe. He has set his face to go to Jerusalem. And it just keeps saying that he was hurrying. And he's counting the Sabbaths and counting the days. Counting the Sabbaths and counting the days. And he wants to celebrate Pentecost in Jerusalem. All right. He, he wants to demonstrate to the Jews that he has great love for them. He, he wants to deliver an offering to help those of the Jews who are being persecuted. He, he wants to show that he's devoted to the law. So he wants to be in Jerusalem. But watch what Yahweh does. <clears throat> Acts 21 verse 3. Now, when we had discovered Cyprus, we left, left it on the left hand and sailed into Syria and landed at Tyre. And there the ship was to unlade her burden. And finding disciples, we tarried there seven days, who said to Paul through the Ruach HaKadosh, through the Spirit, 
you shouldn't go to Jerusalem. That wasn't their opinion. That, that wasn't their personal uh, you know, love for Paul coming out. They were prompted by the Holy Spirit to warn him, do not go. How many warnings would you need? Wouldn't one be enough? Should have been. Then we get to verse 8. And the next day, we that were of Paul's company departed and came into Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip the Evangelist, which was one of the seven, and abode with him. And the same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. And as we tarried there many days, there came down from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus. And when he was coming to us, he took Paul's girdle, bound his own hands and feet, and said, Thus saith the Ruach Kakadesh, the Holy Spirit, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owns this girdle, and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. And when we heard these things, both we and they of that place besought him not to go to Jerusalem. Here this prophet comes. And says, here's what Yahweh is saying to you. He told you not to go. Already. He's telling you if you do go, it's not going to go well for you. He told you not to go because he's trying to protect you. When you get there, they're going to arrest you and they're going to turn you over to the Romans. It's not going to go well for you. And when we, his company, heard these things, we and the people in that community besought, begged him, do not go. What did Paul say? Ah, I didn't click it over for you, did I? There it is. Here's what Paul said. <clears throat> what mean ye to weep and to break my heart? For I am ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Master Yeshua. That's uncontrolled zeal. That sounds holy. It sounds holy to declare, man, I'm not only willing to be bound, they can arrest me if they want. I'm willing to die for my Messiah. It sounds holy to you realize that he's defying Yahweh. Yahweh didn't want him to die. Yeshua didn't want him to die. Yeshua didn't want him arrested. Yeshua is, is, is beseeching him and warning him, please don't go. But Paul, driven by uncontrolled zeal, went anyway. Just a few verses later, we read that he came into Jerusalem, met with James, purified himself, took a vow to prove that he kept the law, but nonetheless, when he walked into the temple, the Jews immediately attacked him. Yeah. <clears throat> Verse 31 of that chapter says, they went about to kill him. They, they weren't just roughing him up. When they caught him in the temple, they went about to kill him. And had it not been for the Roman soldiers breaking it up, they would have killed him on the spot. So he gets turned over to the Gentiles. He eventually will be killed as a result of this one decision to go to Jerusalem. What's that got to do with the Lunar Sabbath doctrine? Everything. This has been a heart-wrenching series of messages that I have had to deliver. And because I am confident that the majority of those who hold to this doctrine got there because of their zeal to serve Yahweh. And their zeal to do great and mighty things for Yahweh. But that zeal has caused them to no longer be able to hear the warnings of the Ruach Kakadesh. The warnings are everywhere exposing the falsehood of this doctrine if you can hear them. But there's none as blind as those who will not see. It, it, it's not... That, that I or you look at the Lunar Sabbath doctrine and think that it's too difficult to keep, that's an accusation lacking foundation. I, I've never pulled back from anything that I found to be true in Torah. 
I haven't pulled back from it. Still a lot I got to learn, but anything that I've seen that's true, I haven't pulled back from it. We have done a lot of things, which at first we have, which at first seemed very difficult. Looking back now, it really wasn't that difficult. But, but at first, it seemed difficult. Telling your parents, my children won't be celebrating Christmas anymore. My children are not going to celebrate Easter anymore. At the time, that seemed massively difficult. I mean, we could go down the list of, no, we're not going to worship on Sunday anymore. <clears throat> we're not going to eat pork chops and shrimp anymore. And at first that even seemed difficult to us, but then it really became difficult when people looked at you and judged you for it. What, are you Jewish? Are you a Jew? Yeah. Are you a Jew? I think it was a man that taught me to say, no, I'm not a Jew, but I'm kind of Jewish. So, <clears throat> Jewish. Oh, I wish the Moors are down in Florida this week. I, I wish they were here. Their, their daughter had a friend. I'm going to tell it. You probably have heard it. We buzzed around lunch, but not everybody's heard it. But their daughter had a friend from public school. And they kind of got just sweet on each other, not not dating anything, just sweet on each other. And 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 the boy was hanging out with Will and Colin and the like. And everything was going good until the boy's parents found out who we are. <laughs> and uh, so they began to put the brakes on. And it came to the point that the boy called his parents and said, hey, Will and Colin are going out for pizza. Can I go with them? And I think it was the mother. Is that right? Do you remember? It was the mother that said to him, you can go, but you got to promise me you'll get pepperoni on your pizza. You've got to promise. Because you see, in their thinking, you're being disloyal to Jesus if you don't eat pig. If you're not going to order pig on your pizza, you can't go. And then the way I heard the story was they sent the grandparents to the pizza place to make sure that he got pepperoni on his pizza. So... That's how weird it is out there. So sometimes things can get difficult. <clears throat> right? At work, family, yes. all kind of events. It, it gets difficult. So we've never turned away from something just because it was difficult. I didn't look at the Lunar Sabbath Doctrine and think, whoo, hey, no way I'm doing that. That's too hard. What I did is I examined it thoroughly, I tested it thoroughly, I found out that it had no scriptural support, it was based on conjecture and fabrication and mistranslation and wrong definition. Worse yet, I found it to be a demonic attack against Yahweh's true Sabbath, no different than the first day of the week is. I have not thrown insults at those who have fallen prey to it, and I'm not doing that now. I'm saying that they have a zeal for Yahweh. But in this case, their zeal is not according to knowledge. Their zeal has actually led them astray from truth. You see, obedience is not a burden. <laughs> it's a joy. Amen. And perhaps, as I mentioned earlier, it's the joy that leads some people astray. I grew up a Baptist. We never talked about obedience. We, we, we only talked about having saving faith in Jesus. That's all we talked about. 
I, I spent a great deal of time in the Word of Faith movement. We never talked about obedience. We only talked about having faith in God for stuff. In both places, we were actually taught that trying to obey the law was to fall from grace. To obey the law was impossible. And if you tried to obey the law, you're going to put yourself in bondage. That's what we were taught. But Yahweh in His mercy drew me out and drew me to Torah. And, and I, like you, found that His instructions are not grievous. They, they bring peace. They bring joy. They are wisdom. They are holy. They are just. They are good. They're, they're delightful to learn, keep, and do. Delightful. When I find something in there that I didn't know, it, it's not, oh gosh, another one. It's yes. How did I not see that? And I, I cannot help but think that some in discovering the joy of obedience have just kept pushing and pushing and pushing, looking diligently for some greater thing to obey. So they can prove how much they love Yahweh and how much they love obeying. But like the Pharisees, just because they make the Sabbath more difficult to keep, that doesn't mean they have done a righteous thing. Like the Pharisees, they're actually condemning the guiltless and walking in error. You did run well. Who has hindered you? So, in conclusion to those last two objections, uh, number nine, number 11, <clears throat> we are not taking away from Torah when we reject their false claim about Psalm 104, 19. In fact, what we're doing is defending Torah from being twisted by a misinterpretation of Psalm 104, 19. And number two, we're not rejecting the Lunar Sabbath doctrine because we think it too difficult. I'm not saying it's not difficult. Absolutely. It's difficult. That's not the reason I reject it. We're rejecting it because not only is it false, but it's in, in opposition to the truth in a very de detrimental way. That's the reason I reject it, and that's the reason I took the hard stance I have against it. Yahweh bless you and keep you. Yahweh make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Yahweh lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. His name is put upon you, so shall he himself bless you.